Okay, welcome to the producer panel. Um, very pleased to have on the panel tonight Claire Carhill. 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 Will do. Carhill. And Bruce Webb, who've both got a lot of experience in producing, first ADing, directing, I'm not and, and line producing as well, which we're going to talk about tonight. So if I can get you to just introduce yourselves first for us. Oh, I'm first. Yeah, okay. just give us a little bit. <laughs> a little bio, please. Uh, well, hi, I'm Claire, and I, I've met some of you before um, around the around the traps here and there. Uh, I I came to, to film uh, very recently, actually, uh, only about nine years ago. Before I came into film, I was a, um, a criminologist uh, and an emergency service volunteer, but I'd always wanted to be a filmmaker. And so when I had the opportunity to do that, I jumped. Um, Sorry, I'm just switching mine off, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> here's, here's, you, here's you playing a tune, is it? It's a, it's a, it's a, I feel some atmos happening. <laughs> So, a theme tune. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so now I have a theme, apparently. Uh, so um, I had the... Uh, <laughs> yes, this is like QI, isn't it? We get our buzzer sounds. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, I came to, fil to film fairly recently. Uh, when I came to the UK, I was trying to produce, but I realised that I didn't know enough, and so I spent some time working around the traps as an assistant director to get to know the environment, to get to know how things worked. And I was in the bizarre situation where I was too old to become a runner, and I was told this, that I couldn't start at the bottom, but I didn't have enough knowledge to start in the midpoint. So I had to go independent. So I went to rain dance, went to shooting, pe uh, shooting people, mm -hmm. and just got out there and just started doing it. And before very long, I was starting to get lots and lots of calls from people. So I was using the skills that I have from my life generally to apply to the film industry, and it helps that I didn't go to film school in the end. It helps that I use my business knowledge and my life knowledge to make films because I'm not constrained by what I think the right thing has to be because of what other people do. I know what the right thing has to be, has to be because of my life experience and my ethics, my morals and my work practices, and so it's freed me up. So I now work exclusively in independent film. I think I've got about 35 credits. Yep. I think, as an assistant director or a line producer or producer. I teach producing at the Bournemouth Film School part-time, and I'm currently trying almost... I've almost had my superhero slate funded three times. <laughs> I've got three films that are variations on superhero theme, all independent. Mm -hmm. One is the young man who realises he's got a superpower running uh, of running and can win races, which Jerome knows about. Um, one is a parkour superhero with Sebastian Foucault from the Bond film Casino Royale, where he's at the opening with Daniel Craig. Mm. Um, it's a bit like Dirty Pretty Things uh, type story. And the third one is uh, super superheroes who have experienced traumatic experiences which have made them suffer PTSD, and as a result they're now supervillains. The supervillain of them all neuters them, takes their powers away, and now they have to live with all their physical characteristics as superheroes, but they don't have them, and it's called Made Ordinary. And so these are, these are still all independent films, but they are ranging in budget from £300,000 up to £2.4 million um, across, across the slate. So they're intended to be funded, uh, you were talking about EISs and yeah. SEISs last week, I think, or last time. Last time, yeah. Um, they're all intended to be within the £5 million margin for EIS funding, but we're structuring co-productions with, with several of them already to try to work on um, extending the reach with other independent filmmakers. So I've got a great passion for independent film. I think it's a place where we can tell the stories we want to tell. It's a place where the, where the voices that are often marginalised can speak up. Uh, the voices of women, the voices of queer people, the voices of people from different cultural backgrounds, different races. These are all voices that we can, we can make it happen uh, in independent film by being creative and being resourceful. And that's why I was really happy to come tonight to talk about how I've been called in many times to save films when they've just about been about to fall over. And it's just common sense. It's just all of the, the, the brain power in this room can be put into, into play to make really, really powerful films. So that's my very, very short bio. Do you want the long one now? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're getting kicked out of 10, so <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. OK, and then Bruce. Um, I mean, a lot of you have met Bruce before, but... Yeah, so I was on a panel here with, about, about um, distribution. Was yeah, yeah, you were in the first yeah, one, yeah. So I, I came from a... originally went into the industry as a spark and then um, uh, went into producing, and I was a producer for several years. Um, co-producing American films and then British films more recently and, and then um, started directing about 10 years ago and I have first AD before, I had the first AD with you, haven't I? 
think yeah, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> think we murdered you in a scene somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you obviously got better. <laughs> so, for, for, so for a living, I tend to direct television. I've done a couple of feature films, which a couple of feature films, but then also used to really enjoy line, line producing um, low-budget feature films, so ones that are under £150,000, which was the old EIS amount. So um, I think that's why I'm on the panel today, which is really to talk about shortcuts in trying to produce low budget films. Yep, absolutely. Can I start with you? What, can you just describe very quickly what a line producer does? For me? Yeah. Well, what would you say the main roles are? And where does the name come from? Well, we have, I mean, people, other, different people have different opinions. We have below the line costs and above the line costs. And on a movie magic budget, you'll have below, below the line costs, which will be everything from how you're going to pay for car parking or how you're going to pay for toilet roll. And a lot of the above the line costs can, can can involve top talent like actors, producers, directors. So in theory, I think you agree with this line producer is there to deal with um, the day-to-day -day running of, of the sets. So they're produced at the start of the pre-production period. You then um, basically make the thing happen. And the difference between a good and like, bad line producer is a film that stays on, on budget or goes over budget. Mm. And you deal with the, the health and welfare of the crew, the health and safety of the crew. and. Basically, the actual physical, I said this earlier, the mm. physical action of filming, of actually making films quite simple, so putting someone in a room, shining a light on them, and recording what they say, pretending to be someone else, which is the basics of it. The complicated bit is getting all the crew safely from location to location uh, without breaking the law. And that's really what the line producer mm. does in, 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 in hand with the first AD, who's the health and safety person on mm. set. So. Yep. With that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I suppose um, if you've got business experience, an easy easy way to think about it is that above the line are the fixed costs, and below the line are the variable costs. So above the yeah. line, the fixed yeah. costs yeah. are the creative costs because you know you're going to have to pay a lump sum to the actors. Mm. You know, regardless of what happens, how many days we shoot, those costs are pretty much determined. They can be percentages of the budget, or they can be fees in lumps. So. There's a question about how do we how do we work out fixed. Yeah, where does that come from? It's, <laughs> Who um, makes that it's a real it's a real problem trying to. There's no set formula for above line and below line. Right. But what you do know is where you can save is in below line. Yeah. You generally can't save in above line. Those costs are pretty much fixed from the time we had to buy the option from the script, by the time we had to pay for the writers, by the time we've engaged the director and the director says my fee is X, regardless of how many days we shoot, it's going to be. X usually. Um, most unless, unless you rob the director of their fee, yeah. to pay for it, which is quite often. <laughs> well, happens, I, I try it? not to do yeah. that yeah. as a rule. I might only give you ten pounds, but yeah. at least I've yeah. paid you something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's um, yeah. You can't generally save above line. Not generally. You can, so you think of it as fixed costs and variable costs. Is that language that makes sense to you? So that's where you can save. Um, Mm. Because you know that you've got variables that you can work with. Okay, and when are you brought on to do a job? Usually How too soon? late. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, no, I, I, I tend to come, there are two, when I work as a line producer, there are two ways in which I'm engaged. The first is to do a spec budget for financing. So I will do a breakdown of the story and right. I will prepare the first cut of the budget. And it's important at that stage that I'm trying not to undercut the budget because that's the first expectation that the producers and investors are going to have about how much the film is going to cost. So if I say, oh, yes, we can do this for 75 grand, but I know that I'd have to do it for 75 grand to make everything work, and they hand it over to someone else who doesn't have a clue how to do it for 75 grand, mm -hmm. they're in trouble. Um, because they've, they, if I say to them, you could do it for 75 grand, well, I wouldn't do that anymore. I would say, oh, it's going to be 150. Because I know they're never going to get the money that they need. They're always going to have a margin of 10% at least cut off what they ask for. So as a line producer in that stage, at the, the spec stage, I'm going to add in everything I need to make sure that the budget expectation is pitched at the right point. Then I may or may not go on to do the film. Most of the films I do budgets for, I don't want to touch with a barge pole. Um, just don't. They're, I mean, they're, they're stories that I just don't want to make. They're stories I don't want to tell. They're people I don't necessarily want to work with. Um, but they know that my budgets are good, so they ask me to do budgets for them, but I don't actually want to go on set with them. Uh, the next time I go on set as a line producer is usually just after the film has got money and we now need to do a proper production budget. So I need to work out how much money there is, how are we going to spend this money, and hopefully the person who did the budget in the first place has anticipated that things always go horribly wrong. 
So I um, come in then and I work all the way through production until usually about two weeks after we wrap pr principal photography, I do wrap up and then I hand over usually to a post-production supervisor or back to the producers in um, very low budget films where there isn't a post-supervisor. I hand back to them and I go on to my next, my next gig. Okay. okay, that's certainly true. You can you can go. I've I've gone on board on, on Nina Forever. I came on board about a week before we shot, and then um, you've inherited a budget which might not be one that you particularly like, mm. and so um, that's the hardest thing as a line producer, where you've got a, a, maybe some crew have been engaged at an incredibly high rate, yeah. which is really unfair to the rest of the crew because then they're on a lower rate. It didn't happen on Nina, but it can happen on, on certain jobs. So. Um, yeah, yeah we've being, had, we've being had on board as, a, as early as possible is great. Mm. We have yeah. to have, sometimes have to have the haircut dis discussion, <laughs> um, which means that I come onto I came onto a film a few yeah. years ago. Camera crew were all on three hundred a day for the the Beck two rate. And everyone else was expected to be on deferred, uh, including me. And I said, well, this is not going to work. This is not going to happen. So I had to have the discussion with the camera crew to say, I'm really sorry, but you're taking a haircut in the rate. Um, this is this is going to happen. And with the money that I save from the camera crew, I'm now paying. The, the, um, the rest of the crew, so that it's across the board. So mostly in very low budget film, inexperienced producers feel host held hostage to sound, camera, and lighting because Beck2 is very, very strong. But Beck2 will respect, and I know this because I am a Beck2 member as well as Production Guild member, Beck2 will respect if there's fairness and equity across the board. So depending on the budget level, I will either pay crew exactly the same, regardless of the same daily rate, regardless of what their skill is, or if I've got enough money, then I'll rank it into HODs, heads of department, skilled crew, mm -hmm. and then the rest of the crew. So there'll be three grades that I pay people on. Um, the way... And that's really important for equity. The way that uh, the DP then makes more money than everybody else is that the DP is doing more days. Still the same daily rate, but more days. And it ends up being the same. Good news is there's lots of DPs around now, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> but it used to be real, it used yeah. to be such, I'm not saying it isn't a skilled job now, but obviously working with film, it was a much, much, it was a, it was a well, I guess it wasn't more of a skilled job when you're working with film. And so, but now there's so many DPs coming out of universities and colleges, and the equipment is so. They teach them in there at the so moment. So sophisticated <laughs> that we don't feel quite as held to. There's actually some jobs that are quite hard to fill. Mm. Um, still, Sparks. If you want to make money, become an electrician. Mm. <laughs> really? They're the one. They're the gaffers of the one group that you can't pay um, a lower rate to. And it's safety. Yeah. You don't want a gaffer who's um, done a bit of it every now and then. You know, you don't want to <laughs> <laughs> plug in. And, you know, that's. But actually, weirdly enough, lighting is completely changing. The feeling in the industry is that practical lighting will, will yeah. replace... And also with that um, low, low yeah. voltage lighting, LED yeah. lighting means that we don't have quite the electrical loads that we used to yeah. have. So we oh, don't have no quite the risks yeah. that we used to have. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have makeup melting, which we used yeah. to have. <laughs> yeah. So it's all... Um, Sets quite, yeah. aren't quite as hot. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, who are you answerable to? The director, the producer, the producer. everybody? <laughs> well, everybody in a way. Um, <laughs> I think that as a line producer, you're responsible for the team. You're responsible for keeping morale up on the set, making sure that the film will get delivered right. to post-production. So that's my, my job, is to deliver the film to post-production. So I am answerable <coughs> directly to the producer, but indirectly I'm, res I'm answerable to the crew. I'm answerable to them for their, their ability to do their job correctly. Mm. I'm answerable to the talent in the terms that I set a, a terraform an environment where it's a creative environment for the talent. Uh, so I, indirectly, I'm responsible to everybody. Yeah. It's, um, but directly, I'm responsible to the producer. Right. So it's in quite, it's quite, it can be quite a, I mean, I don't know if you agree with me, but I've been threatened, mm -hmm. um, attacked, <laughs> you know, had people burst into tears at me. You know, you've got, it's so, it, it, mm. all hell comes onto you in the mm. first AD, really. Mm. On, on and you need to take it off the first AD because the first AD yeah. needs to be clear for the set. And the producer right. is generally having a mm. breakdown. I mean, the, 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 <laughs> the, the, for the producing director, it's the most special, important day of the whole of their lives and the rest of their lives, and they'll they'll do anything for free. They, mm. And they expect, unfortunately, most of the time, expect you to work 74 hours a day because their vision is so, so wonderful. You know? <laughs> and, and, and I've been in that position as a director and as a producer. But as a line producer, you're like, can we go home now, please? You know, it's, 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 we've done an 11-hour day. So quite often I've been battling with the producer saying, look, I know I'm your friend and I want this to work, but actually we need to get people home safely. Mm. And I've crashed the, the camera truck driving it back because yeah. the, the other people... Are, and, and so it's, um, you, you are answerable to the producer, but quite often they've kind of lost it anyway. So it's really the execs. 
It's also insurance, isn't it? And mm. safety. I mean, yeah. we've been on. I've been on sheets where, unfortunately, forty thousand pounds worth of equipment was stolen out of, a, out of a van, and it wasn't insured. Now, you know, <laughs> that's someone's house. You know, mm. so you know, you lose an uh, Ari Alexa kit. Or you, I mean, I remember on a well, film in Morocco, um, someone signing out all their equipment and then opening it all and it was just bricks. And that, that was like hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of equipment. So yeah. the, you, you as a line producer are responsible. Mm. And, and we've had, I've had crew deliberately, camera crew deliberately leaving equipment outside to get stolen. For someone else to pick up. Yeah, no, well, yeah, no, yeah, I've but, had but, that happen but, too. To, to try and get insurance claims. Mm. Um, and lighting companies trying to say stuff's been stolen. So you're really responsible for your, for your poor producer's um, life in the future. And it's normally the producer and director quality and low budget who are together. So you've got to, uh, mm. you're answer, you are answerable to them. Yeah. Right, yeah. but if the director wants it and you say no, is um, that down we to don't, your relationship? We don't say no. <laughs> no. We, don't, we don't say no. When you mean no. Say, look at this instead. <laughs> we, say, um, we say, we'll go and find out. And then we come back and we say, it's a little bit tricky. Is there something else we can do? <laughs> so we don't say no. Uh, it's really important. That's actually a very important thing. No is a magic, magic word. It's a really magically powerful word. But every time you use it, it loses a little bit of its power. So use it when you have to. Don't say no first off. Don't say no because you mean, can I just have a think? Say, can I have a think? Don't put no because otherwise you're wasting the power of the no. You need that no for when they say, can we just get our actor to look over the edge of this sand because he which I think you know the film I'm talking about, where the actor's right on the edge of the Eastbourne Cliff, where we've been told we can't go more than six metres to the edge of the cliff because it could just drop off. And the director's <laughs> saying, can we just get the actor to go over there and look down, and then we're over the shot. And I said, no. <laughs> and that was one of the few times I say no. The rest of the time I will say, I'll ask. And I'll come back and say, it's, um, it's really tricky. We can't get the people. We can't get the equipment. Can we do something else? Yeah. But we do have the, the, the thing I don't think a lot of people realise that we have a lot of creative control because mm. if we don't like the look of that restaurant, we can screw up that deal. <laughs> and we can have it in that restaurant. I'm sure I didn't hear that. I'm talking about a scene, about scene <laughs> not about food. Yeah. But if you actually think that there's a creative decision, which you shouldn't do, but you could... Oh, you could you can see something that no one else could see. You could help influence. You know, you know, you know that the sounds over there is bad. You know, there's a problem with street crime. You know, there's a problem with railways, and you know, there's all these different problems. But the director is absolutely creatively set on this. But you know, at the end of the day, it's all going to go wrong there. But he won't. He or she won't accept it. Then you can you can influence the shoot. I mean, I think the line producer on um, um, do Lynn Ramsey for not Lynn Ramsey um, uh, Fish Tank. Apparently, I mean, he completely. Um, made that film, uh, made that film happen in many, mm. many ways, through the hard work of bringing actors who brought back in and all the rest of it. So there are that is true because a lot yeah. of the time we're working with directors who um, aren't very experienced, mm. and we have the advantage of going across a whole range of films in a year and getting a lot of experience from all yeah. of those films in the year. So we can come to, up with a lot of creative solutions, and we can often see that things that are being shot will never need to be shot mm. or things that are planned to be shot will never need to be shot but that's where our relationship with the first AD is really really important mm. to make sure that the running order of the sh of the shots is is precise so that the because the first AD as you probably all know reports to line producer not to the director the first AD is there to help take the load off the director to make sure that the director is like this but often directors when they're new they're like this we want them like this we want them stuck at the monitor being fixated on what's being captured in the camera we don't want them getting the idea of what's happening around that so a good first AD will keep that director at the monitor with the cans on oblivious <laughs> to everything else and then we can make the film happen around them and the film just magically happens so that's a good point that yeah, yeah. It's, um, but so often these new directors are just looking all around and they want, to, they want to feel useful. So they go around and they move the prop and then suddenly art department says, shit, continuity. <laughs> and so, and so we, we That's why it's good to direct TV, actually, because what, what, what's freaked me out when, when you go on a TV set is there actually, you know, there's 60 people all working for you as a director. And you, it's all right to ask for a cup of tea. You mm. know, and, um, <laughs> and everyone has their job, you know, standby props mm. do this and that person does that and there's six people in the makeup room. Was on an independent film when you're coming up through film school, you feel like you have to do everything. Yeah, do everything. And um, it's actually quite nice to relax on a feature film and say, right, mm. I'm just going to concentrate. And they, they quite often burn out directors, mm. don't they? So they'll, they'll, buy, yeah. they'll go out, they'll, go, they'll, they'll work all weekend, and mm. by, the all the time, by the time they've got to shooting, they're, they're, they're exhausted. Excuse my language, <laughs> but they are. They, no, they, feeling, they're spent. Yeah. I mean, most producers are, are their worst, at their biggest low the day you start shooting, because that's the 
That's where they've done all their hard work. That's where all the, the money's get, gone out yeah, of the bank. Yeah, the producers get better. <laughs> they they <laughs> get the a better colour. And, and yes, sort of once, once we're more. underway, when I'm not line producing, when yeah. I'm producing, um, once we're underway, I'm just like, oh, now, where's my Facebook? Yeah. <laughs> like, so we're going to catch up on stuff. Yeah, yeah. so you, you'll, the, 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 the producer will just generally feel better and more healthier by the end of the shoot. Mm. Uh, whereas you as a line producer generally just... Yeah, Disintegrate. Just want to <laughs> <laughs> um, is there any questions at this stage? Do chip in. Yeah, do you know? Um, so you <laughs> talked about this example when a, a director is really, really uh, insisting on, like, he wants this location where there's lots of crime mm. or whatever, and lots of noise. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, mm -hmm. you said that. Um, but we've both, uh, we've both had that situation. Yeah, yeah, like, you both kind of, like, talked about this. So I kind of, like, wanted to know, as a, as a line producer, how do you... Um, how do you go about it to research kind of like alternative options that are better or more conducive for the film itself, both financially as well as maybe also creatively? So how much on a creative level do you also have input? So maybe you have any examples? If, if I've come on to the project early enough, and it's, this is a real problem if we've not been early enough to do loca proper location scouting and to know these things. So I've... Um, I was ADing a, a film and effectively, effectively line producing it um, a while ago because the producer was always asking for help with managing the budget, but they didn't have enough money to run a line producer and an, an AD, and so I was giving advice on that. But um, the thing about uh, a lot of the time, this uh, this comes up when people want to shoot guerrilla style. So guerrilla style has two meanings: the right one and the wrong one. The right one is. We can't terraform our environment, so we're going to go and shoot where we can, but we're going to do it with proper permissions, and we're going, to, we're going to know that we are interfering with the public by doing this. So in return for the wonderful production value that the public are going to give us, we're not going to get in their way. The second way, we don't want to even talk about that, because that's just a waste of time, people's time, energy, and it often results in... Um, poor footage because people are rushing to get things and they, because they're, they're looking for the authorities. Good guerrilla filming. I was asked to do a scene where a um, an actor with a prop camera was going to film the CCTV on the side of the Houses of Parliament. <laughs> so this is all about preparation. Of course, we know we're going to get arrested. We know that's going to happen. So we have to prep that. So I, I scouted that with. Um, I was also with my hatters. But the producer and I were location manager and scouted that day, went to look around and we, we understood what we needed to do. Now, I had to say that we got our permission to shoot. Um, guerrilla style filming is permitted. You apply for permission. You're allowed to take up to five, sometimes five, sometimes ten people. Camera has to be off the ground or on one tripod. No lights on the ground. So you have to be a mobile, um, non-nuisance film crew. So we worked out a bas basketball key system. Uh, I don't know who plays basketball here, but you only have so many seconds in the key and you, you tag people in and out. So we can only have five people on the camera. So we only have legally five people on the camera at any one time. So once people are out of the key zone, mm. they're in line of sight, but they're no longer obstructing the public. They're no longer part of the crew for that moment. So makeup, wardrobe come in, do their bits and pieces. They disappear off to a bench where they can see me if I signal for them. Camera come back in again. Camera go out, sound come in, put on the mics, go back out again, camera come back in again, and then we're ready to go. So we've got this all worked out. So that legally, we're not ever breaching the terms of our permit. Being very careful, we're being totally legal. Also saying to the crew, today, everyone who's in this, in this shoot is likely to be arrested. So if you don't want to be arrested, that's all right. You don't have to come. But anyone who's there is going to be arrested. Sorry, but that's just the way it is. So um, but they all wanted to come. So I thought, oh, God, they all wanted to come. Wow. Well. <laughs> so um, so on, the, on the day when we shot, um, on the day means at the time that we shot, um, we, uh, we had the plan that as soon as the shot was finished, the director and the director of photography would take the card out of the camera, because this is in the days of the cards, card systems, take the card out of the camera, put it in his pocket, and it had a little mini DV tape, and that would go into the camera, because we were working with an old, old camera. And if the camera was taken, then they would get a blank DV tape for their trouble. Yep. The card would be safe. But because we had the permit, we knew that we would be able to get, we would be arrested, but then we would be released again. But they could hold the camera for months. They could hold it for any reason they wanted to at that time. So we wanted to make sure the footage was safe. So we did that. Uh, and they were to walk off at a steady pace, obviously with a big camera, 
off they, go, they walk back to our van, which was legally parked in a car park. Meanwhile, myself, the actor, the sound, makeup, uh, and the DP, uh, the, first, the focus puller, would pack up the prop camera as slowly as we could, which we did as slowly as we could, look around, there's still no one coming at us, so I think, well, we're all expecting to be arrested. This isn't fair. <laughs> uh, so we started walking. We got around almost to Westminster Abbey before mm, 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 came charging after saying, stop those people, and we were arrested. Um, so then Sergeant comes up behind them, and, uh, and they say, what are you doing filming us when we're filming you? And I'm oh, my God, I wish I'd had a camera to take that moment. <laughs> so I just casually reach into my lovely high vis and I just pull out my permit, and they go, fuck. I thought, oh. In Australia, that's a summary offence. They could have been arrested for that. I could have arrested them. But anyway, that's the, the whole point of that was that the crew were safe. They knew the risk. Mm. I had done my risk assessments of that area. I had looked at what was necessary to have an escape plan. I was on top of it. All of the crew were informed about the risks. They knew what they were going to face. Um, we protected the camera. We protected the actor. We protected the crew. Uh, so... I think that's the most important thing that we do, is we are assessing risk all the time, I think is probably the way to say. Yeah, I mean, once, at... to answer your question, you always want to say yes to the director, really. Mm. In an ideal world, when you've got a really good, really good location manager, a director that knows what they want, then, um, then you turn up and you, you say, as long as that's brilliant, you've thought about mm. all, the, all the risks involved in filming there. The location manager's found the best location. I mean, and certainly when you're on a TV show, it doesn't normally happen like that. You normally, mm, no. you know, everyone's been working for so many years on something, and they're so long in the and tooth. They know the they locations they can yeah. use. And then, and, and so there's only so many. There's very like there's no warehouses left in London to film in. But like the best one is in Bedford, probably. So there, there's certain locations which we're just running out of, mm. which is a real disappointment. I think we've got, we're getting into that bit later. Yeah. Can I just ask about road closures while we're talking about filming outside? How does that work in London? Ah. Yeah, we, I mean, I, I did. Who did you talk to? We did, did a very low, low budget film recently, um, which was 150 grand, and we, and we rode. Um, it, was a bit, it was a bit odd now what's happened in Borough, Borough Market, but we chased a guy with a police car through Borough Market, and, um, and it cost us just a few hundred quid. Mm. And um, we closed off the roads, no problem. We had a police outrider who was just well up for anything. Well, I mean, we said, can we drive at 50 miles an hour through the market on a Friday night? Yeah, why not? Just do it. So, so, and we did. We literally hurled through Borough Market, which unfortunately never looks as fast as it actually is. Yeah. Um, and then we filmed this big attack on London. Well, it's bizarre now looking back, but it was a, a guy running from the police who had attacked people, and then he ends up being arrested on London Bridge trying to jump off them. And so we filmed on all that. We, didn't, we did close some roads. And, where did um, you go to to get that done? Is there one? Well, if you want to do, now? if you want to do it in a major way, then you have to put a, a notice up in the local paper with the council, don't you? If you've got to close yeah, off you've got large to go through the, the, the council, right? Um, um, but if you want to do small scale road closures, then it's informing the local film office. And different boroughs have different rules, so it's per borough. One's worth you have to pay yeah. for a license. Westminster, you have which, to pay. Which I just point blank refuse to do um, because there's no reason in law why they have to make you pay for it if you're on a low budget. Mm. Thing. So um, legally, legally, any one of us can halt traffic for up to two minutes um, to, to prevent something from happening, to allow someone to cross the road. <laughs> so you work, with that, you work on that, that basis. And I've done a lot of work working around London and around other places, working without having the ability to pay for road closures. Mm. But I have always informed the council about what I'm doing. And I've always said that we will work around traffic. I did a, um, a film two years ago, which is really, again, another triumph of the guerrilla style, because we had Jerry Hall outside Portobello, uh, outside uh, Porchester Hall, um, in a, a convertible, open-top convertible, the day before she was about to announce her marriage to, her engagement to Rupert Murdoch. And so, again, risk assessment, planning everything out, being very aware. So I speak to Westminster and they say, it's going to cost you £50,000 to close off that area. We'll, have, we'll need six weeks' notice because we need to put the advertisements out, we need to let let um, the residents know that they won't be able to use this little cutaway. Um, you'll get your parking waivers in, thrown in for free. Thank you very much for that. That's gorgeous. <laughs> um, we thought we can't afford that. Our budget, our budget was healthy. It was a 300k budget, but mm. we didn't have the money for that. So what we worked out was we bought the parking waivers for the side of the road that we needed. So we're on parking waivers and we're working with, we're not going to close the road. So we're not going to close the road, but we know when we shoot in Westminster, we're always going to get a visit from the anti-terrorism police. We know that they're going to turn up. So um, they did turn up 
and we're, we always run micro crew. We only have as many people as we need outside. Everybody else is somewhere else. So we have Jerry Hall sitting there. Big guys turn up in their big, big tanks and black stuff. And they come marching over and they say, are you on a break? And we say, no, we're filming. And they say, well, where's the crew? I said, it's my crew. And they say, that's only 15 people. I said, yeah, it's my crew. And they said, where's your lights? And I point at a gem ball. <laughs> they say, it's my light. Where's your generator? Well, we're just running a lead into Porchester and it's matted so you can see there's no hazard. And he said, what are you doing about traffic? And I said, well, we can't, we're not closing the traffic. We're working our shots around the traffic. And he said, okay. And he got, it, got out his pad and he wrote down his number and he said, this is my number. Close the road, crack on. So then he said, is that Jerry Hall? And I said, mate, I can't afford to close the traffic. Do you think I can afford Jerry Hall? <laughs> so, uh, so I think doing things properly pays off. Doing things, being yeah. honest about what you're doing pays off. I totally agree. Police are very bored as well. Mm. <laughs> they're, 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 and, and if you haven't followed the rules, then it gives them something to do to... Yeah. If, you're, mm. if you're nice to them and give them a cup of tea and you get permission off them. We did bring yeah. them before tea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 had a, I had a situation on, one, on, on the Haygate Estate where... Um, oh, the lovely Haygate Estate. It's not yeah, there anymore. Yeah, we filmed on constantly. And, um, but um, permission, hadn't been, permission hadn't been got properly. And uh, we had a huge amounts of police turn up. And then I was banned from filming in Southwark for the rest of my life. And all those <laughs> kind of, that, that was... Um, that's because a dead body had been found a few days before and there was a big press mm. thing about it and they didn't want to press, press that. But actually when the police turned up, we did make them tea mm. and they were just like, what's the problem? Yeah. That's a very valid and point so, actually. So they look to see actually what law you're mm. breaking and they, they know about law. Mm. If you're not breaking any law, well, just leave you alone. But a few years ago, it was quite bad. You'd get arrested for filming anything mm. when there was all this when they thought that, you know, terrorists would turn up and yeah. film stuff before they blew it up. Which is why we got arrested. Yeah, so. yeah, which is really odd because obviously nowadays... Everyone's photographing everything. The only time you do get people moaning is maybe say, over privacy, perhaps. Mm. People yeah. say, oh, but they're generally, it's always like, what you're filming, mate. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, thing I would sure say, um, yeah. the thing I would say is that Borough Market and London Bridge now with the events that happened this year, it's mm. getting harder and harder and harder to convince the, the film officers right. of what you're doing. So you need to mm. allow time to talk to them, to let them know what you're doing, to let them, particularly when we're young filmmakers and don't have big production companies behind us, they want to know that we know what we're doing and they will make us jump through so many hoops to make sure that we won't be shining lights into cars, that we won't be... Um, mm. Certain, certain boroughs are better than others, aren't they? Yeah. The Southwark I was really liked, actually. Southwark is really helpful. Hackney used to be good. I don't Hackney still are. They used to be pretty good. Um, what about guns and knives and that sort of thing, if you're out in the public domain with them? Um, Always. Yeah. Always have an armourer. Always, always right. inform the Met Police Film Unit yeah. um, or the local police uh, unit. Um, the offences are now, you cannot use airsoft without an armourer. So people can't be, do you know airsoft, the games like paintball and shots? There used to be a, a little racket of people who were airsoft clubs and they would rent themselves out to independent films saying, we'll bring our weapons with us. It's an offence for them to carry their weapons outside the range of going to and from their air, airsoft sport. Right. They're not allowed to do that. And anyone who is caught with a, um, a weapon is likely to face a heavy fine and or jail. So always have an armourer. And there are many, many armourers who will work you need to check their licensing to make sure they're proper. Yeah. The cardinal rule of working with guns in public is if it looks like it's going to be real and someone from the public is going to make a complaint, then you're in trouble because if the police turn up, you're going to be fined for every single police, police officer who turns up. Right. So I used to work with a, a, a mob of people who would ask me not to inform the police until it was too late to filter down the bureau bureaucracy. So I would have technically informed the police, but it would have filtered down to the film office in time. And they wanted to get away with this, and this was a lark. And I drew the line, and I was sacked for my troubles, when they wanted to do a shot. They were shooting a film about the London riots, and they wanted to... They had all these airsoft people from Essex who'd come in dressed in their CO10 uniforms, you know, the big black gear, and they were about to storm a flat in Peckham. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I lost my job because I had informed the police a full week ahead, and the location manager and I were sitting there watching the clock thinking, this shot's going to happen after lunch. Where are the fucking police? <laughs> and, and just as we were about to break for lunch, the police ring up and say, 
we're, sh we're shutting you down. You're not going to do that shot. And thank God for that. And I was sacked straight away. I was re reinstated after lunch, unfortunately. <laughs> but, yeah. but it was. I've got a similar story. That there was a change in legislation in the UK, unfortunately, because something I produced. We, um, <laughs> we did a film. We did, we did, yeah, no, we did a film called Green Monkey with a director called Rob Sprackling in 1998, just down on Borough High Street, opposite the police station, and we had informed the days before mobile phones, and we had leafleted. So you used to have to leaflet everybody, which you still try and do in areas, leaflet everyone, because not all elderly people have um, mobile phones or, um, you know, technology. So you should tell them by, not just by email mm. to the local. So you normally go to the local residence association, they inform any of everybody, mm. and then of course you leaflet everyone, which I'm sure you all know. But we had uh, leafleted everybody. We had a car with people in masks and white suits, no number plates, on off shotguns. And then people who walked past, and it was the early days of mobile phones. And um, yeah, a full SWAT team turned up. Uh, 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 the head of Southwark Police was taken off a golf course by helicopter. And, uh, and I was sat there with, you know, an entire team of armed response people uh, uh, being told that I was under arrest. And it was, it, but it, it was strange that, I and mean, I didn't get arrested, strangely enough. Um, luckily, Rob, the director, punched someone um, randomly <laughs> on the street. It was a diversion. Nothing, no, no, really, honestly. Um, the location owner, actually, he was Toy Wilcox, his friend. So this whole other fight happened, and, and they, they sort of forgot that they had to arrest me. But the, but the, but the, but the point the point I'm trying to make was that it was, no matter what you do and who you inform, someone can be a long way mm. away. And you do hear stories of people running in mm. and trying to save people's lives. And especially in this day and age, it would be really traumatic for members of the public to see something that, mm. that, that could be, mm. especially what's happened at London Bridge and, yeah. and Westminster Bridge. And the, Bridge. the police are so, likely now to shoot first and then, mm. and then... Yeah, so you've really, really got to take it seriously and, and do, just go to the police, sit down with them and, and, mm. and have a chat with them, is what I'd say. Cool. cool. Very good. Don't think, oh, let's just see if we can get away with it. Because they'll want to help, and it won't cost you um, necessarily. Well, it happened now. And if it, it does, it's £500, yeah. pounds, £500, mm. pounds, I think, for a day for a copper. Mm. So well, they, I, loved um, it. they loved doing it as well. Well, I had a shot, you, a shoot you know, at Hornsey Town Hall, which was nice supposed meal. to be um, 1960s, and it was an AK-47 and a guy in Russian uniform. So I told Hornsey Police, told the Met Film Unit, I didn't even need a... a, a I didn't even need a police person in attendance. Right. Right. But because I told them, it clearly was fake. Mm. Um, clearly was period period piece. We had the people there in um, playing in the, in the fountain, all the public, and we just told them what was happening and then they moved, moved by and the police just dropped by just to see what, how we were going, but we didn't need to have attendance. So if you, uh, if you show that you're planned and you show that you understand the responsibility of what you're doing, then you may get trust from, from them and you don't have to pay, because it is 500 quid to get a police person per day, and we didn't need them. Uh, and we did our, did our shoot with no problems at all. That's cool. It's good that we're British, though, because Brits look stupid with guns, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, we're always in films, we always look better with knives. And, and, yeah. yeah. Baseball bats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, just on this last one on permits and things, um, drones. Can you still use a drone anywhere? Yes. <laughs> in London? Yes, but you have to file the flight plan. Um, we're, we're currently trying to get a shot of our character on the IMAX, and we're probably about 60% of the way there at the moment. Really? But um, they, you, obviously any drone has to be operated by a professional operator. Flight plan has to be filed to make sure that there's no conflict with any of the other civil aviation taking place around, or any of the non-civil aviation taking place around. So as long as the operator's there, file the flight plan, you're not going into the flight path, yeah. and you're well controlled, you can still get it. It's just bureaucratic nightmares. So it's not a no, it's a, we'll, we'll ask, we'll find out, is there another way we can do this? There was right. a good suggestion from, yeah. um, is it, uh, the, the distributor was here last time, um, which yes. is becoming more and more common, which is buying in library footage mm. anyway. Yeah. So you need the fly past to mm. London, just buy in library footage. And don't, 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 it's going to be cheaper to buy in. I mean, do investigate it, because we, yeah. we've just done a really beautiful um, drone shot off the cliffs in um, Plymouth, and it was just, it was really, in the end, quite straightforward to get the licence. But do ask, do find out if it can be done, because it, there's no point saying it can't be done until you know it can't be done. Right. So we're still asking about the IMAX. It might end up being a no, but it hasn't been a no yet. Mm. So um, it's not a 40 metre exclusion zone thing, or is there, but you've got, you're getting around it somehow? No, it's, it's, you've got to it's file the, the plan, you've got to file the plan, you've right. got, they've got to know what you're doing, they've got to know the operator is CAA registered, licensed, yeah. um, they've got to know that there's no other civil aviation going to interfere with that. Right. So the people we're most worried about are private helicopters um, yeah. crossing over and police and ambulance helicopters. They're the people we're most worried about around the river. Okay. So I think drones are going to, I don't know. I think we're in the, the, the peak of drones. I think so as well. Yeah.
Though obviously cameras are going to get smaller and lighter. Mm. You mm. know, there was a short film made entirely on a drone recently, wasn't there? Was that? Yeah, it was in a high definition magazine. They saw, they, just to see if they could do it. Mm. Right. Yeah. I, I just remember seeing a shot of a drone mounted to the ceiling. It was like, well, what's the point of that? <laughs> <laughs> they were trying to see if they could make an entire Actually, film. There yeah. are some interesting things coming with drones because they may not be used so much for aerial footage. In the mo- Car some chases, of, like, brilliant. Yeah. 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 Hovercraft. And also, uh, someone I know filmed in the old white hovercraft. Because you can now set, some of the drones have facial recognition, so you can mm. set the, ca- the actor's face so you don't have to worry so much about losing focus because mm. the focus can be set, the focus distance can be set with the drone. Right. It knows to keep itself at this distance from the the, so the got face. The framing as well, yeah. So you've got you've got the drone and the actor running. So when you've got high speed stuff, it's steady cams are going to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. Little so bit. drones drones don't have to be just because they come off the ground doesn't mean they need to be way up in the yeah. air. Mm. They can be at this and height and them, yeah. do good tracking at at this height. Mm. It's all going to change. Yep. Any Very questions quickly. on this? Permissions and things from the audience? No. Um, can I move on to locations? <laughs> got any good tips of Blagging locations. Just as, as I just said earlier, I think as a line producer, it's getting harder and harder to find good locations yeah. in London. Mm. And and the, 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 when you're when you've got your budget, it's the hardest thing. Is do I move my entire crew to somewhere like Liverpool, which has amazing locations, bits that look like New York, you know, huge warehouses, or do I go to Southampton or Portsmouth where there's more? Um, or but that's a cost of moving the entire crew, or do I try and stay in London and? This gets this this moves on locations is the big mm. I mean locations and actors are your biggest in my opinion mm. your biggest and headache mm. and well and feeding them but yeah. if you're if you're um, loca- if you if you have a certain location set in your in your script as a line producer obviously you've got to try and find that and that's going to be where you're basing where you're filming now crew are increasingly living further and further mm. out of London they can't because they don't it. have any money. So crew are now living in places like Enfield, Barnet, way out east, you know, when people never used to live. And so getting crew into and on set on time on a Sunday, for instance, is getting more, more complicated. Mm. So in many ways, the job's getting more difficult to shoot mm. certain types of scenes. Mm. Yeah. And um, so you get a rise of these films all set in one small room, you know, which, which um, uh, uh, can work if they're absolutely, you know, if, 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 if they're well written. And... and um, but it, it, just locations seem to be getting more and more challenging in, it, in, it in some ways. You know, office, just even an office block is harder to mm. find. Mm. A film London only good for this. So you used to have a location. Well, each borough has its own film. Has its own film the um, problem we're fighting is um, things like Stan Lee bought out all the, like, the London locations around, around the Southwark area um, like two years ago when they were filming. It was impossible to get anything because all TV had all the locations and they can set up a unit base, like in the Surrey Keys car park, there's a unit base there tonight. Mm. They can set up a unit base and they can move out from there. Whereas when we're independent, we're usually a movable feast. Mm. We're usually moving from area to area to area to area. So the thing I do now, um, after when I was doing um, capsule, it was <laughs> outer space was a barn in Essex. Um, <laughs> the real problem we had was the, the cows because <laughs> we couldn't get rid of the cows. Sound designer, the sound recorder tried, <laughs> but he couldn't get rid of the cows. Right, yeah. um, but it was a barn in Essex, and I modelled it out because most of the crew were coming from West London, and we were losing an hour and a half every day just in traffic. We were losing mm. an hour and a half just getting people to the set, and so it became cheaper for me to go to the Premier Inn and say, if I do a bulk block of rooms, can you do a really, really, really sexy rate for me? Mm-hmm. And they did a really sexy rate for me, and I put people, you know, bunking them up together. It was cheaper to shoot in Essex and travel people to Premier Inn, just travel them backwards and forwards, then to try and get them from even East London, because I live in East London, getting out to Essex, I was getting stuck on the A13 every day. And it was just, they kept saying, you, get, you keep saying you're getting stuck on the A13. And I said, yes, I keep getting stuck on the A13. <laughs> doesn't matter whether I get up at six o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, I'm going to get stuck. It just keeps happening. So um, think, we model yeah. it out and see... Mm. So a lot of the time we will go somewhere else for all of our interiors and close exteriors and then we'll bring a skeleton crew into London to shoot any of the London landscapes that we need on a day or two day basis. So we'll come and just do a travel around, get our location, geography shots, but shoot somewhere else outside. Is there things like you know, police stations, hospitals, exterior well, police shots? Police stations there's a lot of because mm. they just close so many down. Yeah, so some... in London we do have a lot, but mm. they'll be disappearing soon. Mm. Not, none of them are set up as... Hospitals, all hospitals have wings that you can film on now. 
um, they all they're all pretty yeah. much privatised. And, and look for um, look for specialist so, hospitals because um, we've um, we've we shot in Walthamstow Whips Cross in the um, hyperbaric unit uh, because it wasn't being used on the weekend. So we knew that if there was a diving emergency, we'd have to move out. Mm. Fortunately, there wasn't, so we were able to shoot all weekend. They, so they have to keep capacity. Yeah. But they are they do end up being weekend shoots. Mm. Right. The one thing I was going to say is if you can't find the right location, you've just got to ask the director to try and tell the same story, Somewhere but in, else. in a different place. Mm. And it's become so obsessional on low budget that they, you know you've got to be you know you don't have to set this conversation in a cafe could it happen i know it's all mm. teaching you know i know it's teaching grandma to suck eggs and what, what, what i'm saying now but but it, i mean i know on nina we were getting very stuck on it, it had to be in this specific place you know mm. actually it could be told somewhere else it's just a conversation it's, it could yeah, be told so somewhere else. and you ended up with something much cooler you know mm. yeah. when i remember i remember on one film i got the direct we we and this is no lie we managed to get a 747 that could be pulled along a runway up at Stansted and then get a stuntman to, as dressed as a nun to fall down the steps. <laughs> and we got it for free for, for a friend. And the director said, no, he didn't, he didn't want it. He was a bit over the top for the beginning of the film. So, you know, as a line producer, you can really pull something out of the bag, yeah. can't you? So you can say, look, you can't have this cafe that you want to film in. But I can but give you this. have you thought about a riverboat, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Have you thought about something much, much bigger? And so you can really... You can really, I mean, quite often you might get a negative mm. reaction because they're like, oh, no, that's your idea. It's not my, like vision. my idea. It's yeah. not my vision. But you can, you can get something mm. bigger. But but can locations you, are kind of getting very dull in London. Like, London's getting very dull. You just have to be dull. creative, yeah, don't you? Yeah. But like, can it's you do an exterior, all the same, isn't Can it? you do an exterior of a police station hospital without permission, just film it? No, you get permission. You, but to yeah. use it as an exterior, like point, just a walk-in shot? The very first or, point yeah. is we always get permission. Right, and then so you just tick tock, yeah. And, okay. and we've, um, I did get stopped the other day for filming outside a police station. I, but again, I think I just bored. Just, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I had a uh, film that I was working on a few years ago and got permission for people to stand outside St Thomas's and just film the ambulances coming in. But in their wisdom, they decided to go to King's. Um, mm. And they got shut down because I got the permission for St Thomas's, but they decided that seeing as they were in Denmark Hill anyway, they might as well just stop and do the shot to King's. And King said, excuse us, that's not what you'd say. Always you're not get allowed permission. to show patients, are you? And same no. thing in a graveyard, and you're not allowed to show graves. You're not allowed to be able People's to read, names read on the graves. Oh, right, okay. So you either... You're not allowed to be able to see the children. Yeah. I've got a fantastic right. production designer who specialises in making um, very thin foam engraved that she can stick yeah. onto the gravestone oh, itself <laughs> and then pull it off again without doing any destruction to the... So there's lots of creative ways that we can mm. make locations look... I, I shot The Best Years long ago, which is sadly not a very good film because it was shot in bits and pieces. The director never had... He was funding it himself. He never had enough money to do a complete scene. So one month he'd do all the angles that way because the actors were available. <laughs> and then a month later he would do all the angles that way. <laughs> and it shows. Winter, summer. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But um, he, we had to do a shoot in Derry and we were supposed to take Martin Kemp across to Derry. And I was nervous about this because I knew that... I was, I was ADing it and I knew that he hadn't got proper insurance. I knew that he was being sold pups by people all over the place telling them they could get him this actor and that actor and the other actor. And I knew Martin was coming in, but I also knew that trouble was starting to kick off in Ireland again. And I was really nervous about the idea of taking Martin Kemp to a city that I didn't really know, uh, where I couldn't react really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. And so I said, show me pictures of, show me pictures of Derry, show me pictures of this cafe that you want. And so we found locations in Red Hill that looked Derry-ish. And we actually found a church spire that from a certain angle, which happens to be in the intersection of two streets, you look up at that and that looks just the dead ringer for the cathedral in Derry. And so mm. we did all of our closes in Red Hill. We did that one shot of the boys sitting there eating fish and chips with the cathedral in the background in the middle of an intersection in Red Hill. Um, empty, middle of the day, no one coming at all. Uh, and then they took um, three people over to go and do location geography shoots around Northern Ireland to get the, the establishing shot. So there's so much magic we can do as independent filmmakers with a good establishing shot. A good establishing shot will sell what follows yeah. if it's inside a cafe or inside a room like this. If we've seen the Eiffel Tower somewhere, we can easily, and I start speaking like a French person, we can pretend we are in Paris. <laughs> so we can do so many things just by being imaginative and remembering we've got the magic of film on our side. Cool. So that's probably answered the period drama filming question as well then. How would you do period drama I on a low budget? I wouldn't, to be on low budget. I just, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Huh? For us. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. We did it. Yeah, we <laughs> filmed in, um, filmed in <coughs> one of the most expensive buildings in, in the whole world and you got it for free, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good plan. Yeah, well, exactly, I wouldn't do it. I mean, uh, on, a on a feature <laughs> film... It's a CG, the 
the drain pipe out, mm. first of all, and one bin. <laughs> right. Don't allow us to move. Yeah. You're painting things green, then, I. French colony. Yeah. And... yeah. I just remember King's Speech filming. I used to have this coffee shop in Elephant Castle in the studio there, and they filmed King's Speech, and they hired. I mean, the, the amount of effort put into that, and the mm. amount of money. It's absolutely enormous, and if you're on a low budget film, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even look at a script that was low budget, uh, that was drop, that was period drama if it was low budget, because I, you know I did you've when got I was to be. Movie. Yeah, <laughs> I, th- yeah. I, I mean, I think, I think, having seen films, I won't name them, where the streets look too perfect, mm. and you know, it's, it's really hard to get it right. Yeah, true. And um, it, you just leave that to Holly. Hollywood, maybe. Well, you, you can. You, can, you just need the money. You yeah. can do it, yeah. but the scale yeah. is going to be quite small. Yeah. So as long as you know. Eighties is even harder. Eighties like, is the hardest. Eighties and seventies are very close. hard to get the clothes together, mm. to get the props. The old technology. Yeah, the posters. <laughs> the mobile the, phone. You can do a contained film. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. The scale is going to be smaller, so you're not going to have, like, Versailles. You're not going to have it in the 17th century without money. But you can do you can do very contained things. So if the story demands it on low budget. Yeah. So I, di- I did this film a long time ago with a new director who... It, it, it's, it's kind of unconsciously funny or unselfconsciously funny because it's ultimately a sex farce, a romantic comedy, a flat-out slapstick thing. It's Brokeback Mountain meets Jane Austen, which intrigued me. <laughs> it intrigued me. And so I thought, oh, I've got to do this because this is just really weird. And unfortunately, it's not a very good film, but it was set in the um, in Jane Austen Regency times. Made a good fist of, of achieving the the period look. Mm. We found a, an estate house in um, in Crawley that we were able to use. It had the right setting. And it was a question of just keeping, keeping everything very, very contained. So we never got the grand cinematic scale. Mm. And the film didn't suffer from that. The film suffered from the script. And that was, that was the main thing that I learned, was make sure that the script is right, because what's the point of spending all that effort when it just ends up being a dog? That's a the opposite of the scale is sci-fi, of course. Yeah. You don't know what it's going to be in the future, so you can make anything up. Uh, so that's the, yeah. that's the joy, I suppose, of sci-fi opposite period drama. Everyone knows what the period looked like. There's well, no Capture was period as well. Yeah, so right. Capture was 1950s, um, but that was all set in sort of space, so we knew what the... The problem that we had with that was that, again, some of the production designers aren't yet experienced in how to design, period. So they built, and I came onto it after the set had been built, they built the set exactly to the specifications of the Mercury capsule. Now, I'm not quite sure if I've misread my history, but I'm fairly certain that the designers of the Mercury capsule did not ever anticipate two red cameras being on board. (laughs) And this squashed the film because they hadn't thought about how were we going to get perspective. We could not use a long lens at all. So we're all wide. And so the, I don't know if anyone has seen Capsule. I had the world premiere at my festival. Oh, yes. What did you think of it? I loved it. it I think good. we did a good job. About that yeah. Everything looks super wide, which could be stylistic, but it's not what they wanted. What they wanted was the classic, he's, he's claustrophobic in this tiny capsule. Instead, he's in this lovely big dashboard of a Chrysler. That's true. <laughs> Getting a room bigger than you actually want it to be is quite important. To yeah. get the camera further back. Yeah, to, yeah, get, the, to, get, the, yeah. to get it. And it's a big problem. We, you, you so often go on location and look at this room's perfect. The cinematographer goes, no, it's not. And you can't understand why. Because you want, it's because they want to get the camera way back and then zoom in. Costumes, any tips on costumes and hiring and making? Uh, just made a poo costume recently, uh, talking poo for a commercial. <laughs> um, Would you like to expand, so we, expand on that? Well, it's World Toilet Day on Sunday, so we have to do a commercial. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Commercial, yeah. <laughs> six, six million people don't have, that's six billion people over half the world's population don't have an actual toilet. Mm. Can you believe that? <clears throat> so... Um, so on one scale, you might be trying to find a poo costume and then you might be able to find a <laughs> policeman's uniform. But I think, yeah. what was the question like? Well, like Just, yeah, like police, police. Yeah, like the, the trick with police like uniforms is, um, Sorry, really is hire your hire extra them. with it yeah. and then it won't cost you anything. So there's police extras, for instance, and you just hire them in. They come in uniform. <laughs> <clears throat> they normally ex They know how to behave. Um, yeah, um, ambulance, ambulance, paramedics. You hire the ambulance with the actors with the uniforms. Mm. They're normally paramedics themselves. So I wouldn't. If you've got a really specific role, um, is that from an agency? Yeah, they're separate agencies. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, go, yeah. go straight to an agency cool. that does the whole thing. Then you won't have to dress them. Yeah. You won't necessarily have to make. And them also, up they so have much, the right? license. There's a couple of agencies that have the license from the police to present because um, it's an offence to dress as a police officer mm. if you're not a police mm. officer so these agencies so have the licence 
and know what to do to change the badges and change their style so that they're not actually technically misrepresenting the public or misleading the public in uniform. But, it, but yeah, so often nurses, real paramedics, real doctors, real nurses, and real mm. look, look the part, have a walk, and a, but as an actor, can't quite often put it off. I you think know, the big thing... Um, perfect, and they always look like someone playing somebody. You know? yeah. and police officers never seem to have the right... Uniforms never fit when they're actors. Whereas the extras that already come from the agency, they know the yeah. uniform really well. They're not, I've got, they're not wearing their hats. They're not walking into walls while they've got their helmet Yeah, on. but they're also, they've got that um, authority. Um, authority, yeah. And so costumes, anything else yeah. with costumes is that they can come back and cost an absolute fortune mm. when they get damaged. So... Um, we had it. We had when the old Talkback Thames studio was still there, and we could use the um, the set, the the um, the set down there, the police set. We had guys from an agency, and they had to take the boots off uh, because of sound. So they need to be able to walk around in their socks, so they're not going to interrupt sound. And they were able to keep their carriage, keep their bearing, keep their their performance, mm. so that they still looked like police. Um, we had another film where we had to do that, and the guys were just tiptoeing around, and they looked like they were dancing around the set because they didn't have the boots holding them to the ground. So the guys who are trained, ex-military, ex-police, ex-emergency services, they know how to, how to carry themselves, and it adds production value. Costume is one of the areas that can really let us down in production value, so always make sure it's budgeted for and always make sure there's a proper person taking care of it. The number of times I've had saying, actor will bring their own, it's like, that's no good to us at all. If actor is going to bring their own costume, a costume person has to manage that for us because we have care, we have preparation, and we have continuity that we need to look after. Mm -hmm. So if actors are going, and we need to make sure that if anything happens, we've got dry cleaning money in the budget to return the costume elements back to the cast and the condition better than we receive them. But never skimp on costume. Costume. Pretty grim for an act to be wearing the same costume for six yeah, weeks. Yeah, we've got to wash it and go after it. <laughs> yeah. Or they forget, they, they rushed out the day uh, on, the, on the morning and they think, oh my God, I forgot the bow tie, but we need the bow tie. Yes. So what do they do, come late to set and we have to send a runner or did we have the costume then and there? So There's always handcuffs, always get somehow separated. That's the biggest argument. <laughs> that, isn't it? Props claim their props, costume claim their, sorry, costume claim their props, yeah. Yeah. props claim their costume handcuffs. They never seem to be, be stay attached to so, the, so you decide to the who, uniform. You decide if it's going to be a prop or if it's going to be costume. So yeah. if it's part of Hand the character... Handbags are a nightmare as well. Handbags are a nightmare because they're usually part of costume. Briefcases can be, if the briefcase is moving away from the actor, it's a prop. So if the actor is carrying or wearing it, it's costume to be as part of their character. If it's an element that is going to move from person to person to person, it's a prop because it's going to move through. So, but the thing is, we decide as line producers who is looking after this bloody briefcase. Costume, you have it because you've got all the handbags, you have the briefcase. So we know whose responsibility it is every day to bring that item to the set. Sounds really pedantic, doesn't it? It's, it's actually can ruin a day. Yeah. While it's you're lost, driving, yeah. Lost, lost, some runner's gone off for six hours to get some <laughs> but, bloody but costume, costume, <laughs> costume is production value. What is in front of the camera is production value. So if you're thinking about the location and the set, if you can't get the big set that you want, scale it down so it still looks believable. <clears throat> mm. Think about what the audience are going to see. They don't know what is around the rest of the room. They didn't know that the walls were here. They think that the walls were there, depending on how we frame. So, again, talking to the director and the DP the night before to say, how are we imagining we're going to shoot this? And listening to what they're saying, we can sometimes head off some really wasted time trying to dress all the corners of the room when we're only going to see this much mm. of the room. Yep. Talking handbags, product placement, how much can you blag and actually get... Not heaps. paid, but get free stuff it's for product placement. Heaps. Yeah. Heaps. Um, going through agencies again. Um, right. When we did UFO years ago up in Derby, uh, we had a, a, an eight-minute Steadicam scene, Steadicam shot going through a supermarket, just people panicking. And costume uh, art department were thinking, well, how are we going to be able to dress all of this? Because we can't just move things along. And we went to the product placement agency, and there was a new brand of Polish um, goods, fast-moving goods, coming into the country. And so they gave us... Boxes of Polish crisps, boxes of Polish beer, boxes of Polish um, fizzy drink. And so all we had to do was dress the front yeah. layer of the supermarket with all of this Polish food, and then we got to enjoy it in the wrap party. But don't expect, <laughs> don't, don't, don't fall into the trap that you think you're going to get huge amounts of money get, in your budget. For no, you won't get placement. anything. What you, you get is a free licence. a major star involved in a big distribution deal. I mean, even 
even a film like The Borrowers, I think they got 50 grand for having a giant Hinespeak bean can, but that's all they got. So don't ever think that you know, someone's going to be honoured. One, one, you get free stuff, though, when you? Like you're saying. You get free stuff. There's agencies that will give it to yeah. you, um, but don't... don't um, but also, you've got to store this stuff, mm. and you've got to move it around. But it's good. Mm. It's nice if you can get some beers and the rat party. Yeah, yeah exactly. well, we, we, we bounced off the back of the, the Bond campaign for Heineken mm. for a couple of films mm. because Heineken was really backing Bond, and so the um, product placement people were, were awash with Heineken. So there was um, a couple of films that I got. We got crates of Heineken, like two or three crates of Heineken per film, to dress into pub scenes. You have to honour your agreement as well. Yeah, which you've is got really to important. show the. This time, you've got to show the label. <laughs> on on um, TV shows. You, ITV shows or whatever, you have to show mm. the Tesco sign mm. uh, three times in, in a script. Or, so you can't just get product placement and then just Not use it. <laughs> you know, you've got to, got to scoff it after you've used yeah. it. Yeah. One thing I, I, I mean, I take, take this as a pinch of salt, but one thing I think a lot of people get paranoid about is um, seeing products and saying, oh, they're going to, you know, like Apple products. Or, I think it's gone, gone is the day where we're that worried about seeing products in mm. place. Within a, I was going to ask, you have to cover the logos uh, yeah. up when you've got an it's, iPhone and a, I mean, it's, this, that and the other? It's a, risk you, it's a risk you take. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got such a big hit, as they say, where well, there's a hit, there's a writ. If you've got such yeah. a big hit that, that Apple are going to see you because their computer's in the corner of the room, I don't think you've got that much to worry about. But, but if you're doing a close-up of a phone, you want to see the text on the phone. Do you have to make sure you can't see what sort of phone it is? People get so bothered about it on set. And I actually mm. think it. I think on television, you, you, it's a different. It's a different thing. But on a low-budget independent film, if you're saying this product is shit and it's attacked me, mm. or mm. you know, if you're defaming that product, yeah, yeah, just use I mean, it. Anyone phone, like yeah. Cassandra or Katie who do clearances mm. will kill me for saying this. Because you know, <laughs> that's, I, I mean, that's the point. You do, the you do detail um, clearances, yeah. and then you're doing neck check afterwards. But right. Actually, I remember having a debate over the London. You know, the London Underground sign is copyrighted. Yeah, the yeah. Yeah. And then people getting so wound up on set about it, and I was like, oh come on. If it's no. incidentally shown as part of the landscape, so it's okay. At a bus stop, it's like, mm. If um, if it's focused on, yeah. then you've got to pay them license fee. And you can get insurance against that anyway. So you can get you know insurance in America so, against being sued. So and here as well. But the thing that's most important is, is to yes. <laughs> um, from my budget, it's super expensive. Yeah, yeah. The thing that's important is to as you go through the script, start to think about your own clearances. Think about things that, like songs, are really, really a nightmare because Sony have lots of little workarounds that go through watching all these little films, thinking who are they going to send a threatening letter to. Um, Happy not birthday to copyrighted. No, it's out. Oh, it's come out. It's come out. It come out. Yeah, yeah, there's a legal case. It was last year. copyrighted. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, um, the thing that... Um, I think you can use it now. I think it's come through, isn't it? I, I tend... Court about you it. can use it because yeah. um, the, their extension yeah. of copyright was deemed invalid. So yeah. it's been it's actually been out of domain for about 50 years and we just didn't know. Yeah, yeah, they've been scamming us. So... <laughs> fortune for that. <laughs> <laughs> Asking for your money, mate. But the thing that's important, I think, <laughs> it's is back, it's, it's better not to take the risk. So when we shot Gridiron a few years ago, Gridiron was a universal picture. And unfortunately people fucked up along the way and gave Universal the opportunity to pull out of production on the first day of photography because the money hadn't been put in the bank. Um, apparently on our side, we had breached our obligations. I was only first ADing at that point, but um, our budget went. Essentially, Universal was funding for a 10-minute trailer to be produced. The British producers, in their wisdom, decided we could make a whole film for £500,000, so let's do that and let's just keep that from Universal and they'll never find out. They found out, particularly when uh, one of the crew decided to post on Facebook that we'd started filming. Uh, and so Universal burned us. But up until the time that we had, had uh, Universal dump us, we were talking to Adidas about funding, the, uh, giving us the, the licence to use the Adidas football boots because they're the only ones that make American football boots that we can use. And so the three stripes are really quite, quite prominent. My advice to the director and producer, as the AD, as it happened, was to say, we, until we know that we have that licence in our hand, saying that we can show the Adidas stripes, we can't show them. We've got to cover them up, um, because we can't wait for Adidas to get back to us. They, by the time we started filming, they still hadn't answered our question, because now that Universal wasn't involved, they weren't so interested. So the decision that we took was to cover the Adidas logo wherever we saw it, and it's just as well, because eventually they got back to us and they said, no, you may not show the logo in your film. So that would have been a post-production nightmare to try and paint out, you know, paint in between the mm -hmm. three stripes. And that was money that the director no longer had. He'd already sold his house to finish the film. He'd already um, mortgaged everything he had to finish the film. So he, and the film has made it out there. It's not, a, it's not as wonderful as it could have been, but it's a solid, solid performance. It's got heart. And it's now 
making a bit of money on we iTunes. Did, yeah, yeah, right, there's there's a film, film I was involved in where they didn't clear the sports footage for worldwide um, usage, and, and the film, the producer was had a cease and desist letter sent to them at AFN, mm. and the film now can't be released ever mm. outside of the UK. I and tend to err on side of caution. That, that, yes. So even though I said earlier, don't worry about certain things, you obviously worry about those things. The bigger ones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like someone else's footage. Yes, yeah, mm. Mm. Oh, yeah absolutely. And songs. Um, any questions before we get near the end? That's a question about um, budgets and, and live producers getting budgets, because I was quoted, I've got a film that I want to make and I, I kind of want to make it under 150, um, but the only live producer I could find all wanted to charge me in excess of 5,000 just to make my budget, and they couldn't guarantee that they could bring it in for under 150,000, so I, I just don't know what to spend or, you know, to people other producers say, just do it yourself, but I don't know, it's <laughs> Well, you could learn. You could go yeah. on a course uh, at the National Film and Television School. No, I don't I teach there. It's not a plug. <laughs> learn how to use movie magic and movie, movie budgeting, uh, which is about six, seven hundred pounds, and do it yourself if you're the producer. I think it's a, I think it's a good skill for producers to have to know how to budget. Um, I mean, I started line producing as a subset of producing. I think it's a good idea because you do find people who don't budget the way that I. The way that I would like to budget for low-budget films is I know that once the money's gone, the money's gone. There's no one sitting there backing me up. That contingency doesn't really exist in the real world. You know, executive producers are not going to want us to use that contingency. So we need to budget the contingency that we know we're going to have, the real risk that we're going to have of going over inside the budget. So it's really important that you know that the person who's doing your budget for you is not just calculating the shoot length on the number of average pages per day, but is actually understanding the script. So you would expect for five hundred for five thousand pounds, which is not it's a lot of money, that they're going to have given you a proper schedule. Um, location agnostic, of course, because you don't know what the locations are, but they've broken down the script, they've broken down the number of props, they've broken down the number of story days and therefore the number of costumes, they've broken down the number of crew that you're going to need. Location agnostic means we start each new location on a new day. We can't assume that we can do two locations on the same day because we have no idea where they're going to be. We could have a kitchen here, which we can shoot today, but the living room is there that we're going to shoot tomorrow. So we can't go, oh, yeah, we'll do the kitchen and the living room on the same day. So every new location ha has to have its own, and that way you're building in enough room to move in the budget. It depends how big the film is, but I do a budget and schedule for like 1,200 <coughs> quid. Mm. Nice, thank you. you know. <laughs> Depends, I was waiting for you to picture it, but you know. But that's the ballpark. That's, that's the ballpark. Um, that's the ballpark I would have expected as well. You're getting a spec budget done, so you don't. Have, you're paying for this out of your pocket at the moment, I imagine. Mm. And so when I'm doing spec budgets, it's the same. It's around about for me one percent of what the budget is expected to be. So if it's a, um, it's a, if it's a fifty, one hundred fifty thousand, then I would be expecting to charge fifteen hundred to do it. If it's thirty, uh, three hundred thousand, I'm going to say, all right, well, you obviously. Depends on, depends on comp I did a did a really horrific horror film recently, but it was really complicated, <laughs> mm. and it took forever because there's certain things I didn't know. Well, the thing you is, know, I had you to, have to do the schedule too, don't you? Yes, well, you do, but you need I to know how many shooting days. Every, everyone works differently, mm. but I do the schedule first. Yeah, I do the schedule yeah. first, and then do the budget mm. second. Yeah, I go. I do a proper breakdown, and I'm trying to understand because I don't is, have yeah. a. But, the, but this leads on to the biggest thing that happens all the time, which every feature film director and producer does, which is they say we're going to shoot over 20 days. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna, you're gonna shoot over 20 days, and then you know it's not gonna happen in 20 days, you know it's gonna be 25 or 26. And it's just mm. like, well, why are you making something at six, seven pages a day? Mm. Whereas, you know, that's just telly, mm. you know, and, and, not, and the telly we're seeing now, which is why no one's going to the cinema, is two or three pages a day. So, the cinema has to be something completely separate from television, mm. it has to be an elevator, you know, it has to be, I mean. The best advice I, I ever got was from um, a producer, Claire, I can't remember her name now, but she always said, if you're going to make a low-budget film, don't make what Hollywood is already going to make. Mm. And that's do something when, different. Yeah, do something completely different, which is what Cassandra did with Nina Forever and the Blaine Brothers. You know, Whether you like it or hate it, it's a different sort of film. So um, I've got completely lost on the tangent now, but anyway, um, <laughs> what, what were you just talking about? Budgeting. This man's Budgeting. film. <laughs> yeah, so sorry about, 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 about time. I'm like, not yeah, time. So don't, don't, you will end up going, I mean, you'll end up, I mean, nearly every single film I've line produced, produced or been round always goes over. 
uh, they always end up doing pickups. And everyone, and everyone says, um, well, no, this has <laughs> come from the producer. You know, we're going to shoot this amount of time. Yeah. And they say, well, we'll allow three days for pickups. Well, what's the point in allowing three days for pickups? Why don't you actually make your schedule three days longer? Well, actually, I do. I do allow three days for pickups because I know. Yeah, that we all do it differently. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I do. I do allow three days for pickups, which we can use during the shoot as weather cover. A lot of the yeah. time, we don't. A lot of the time, we don't have weather cover. Um, I find trying to get a crew together again. No, it's got to be much in, effort to, to. But it's not. It's still within the shoot window. Yeah, so it's so, still. So yeah, there's three yeah. days at the end of the shoot window. So if I've got the shoot and I've worked out, I've analysed the, the scenes. ADs should understand camera language. They should understand shots, and they should know. You, are, you are for a for a simple scene. You're probably going to have to do 15 takes for a simple scene. So you've got to multiply the the length of that scene by 15 to get a very good sense of how how much camera time you're going to have to use. And then you've got to add in all the faff, all the faff of coming in and doing checks, all the faff of doing lighting tweaks, and you suddenly realise that time is building up. Mm. But you can work out at that point, without having a director present, without knowing what the locations are, what is a reasonable best estimate for the length of the shoot time? And what I'm finding at the moment for very tiny budgets is we're looking about 22 to 24 days, and I try and squeeze two days at the end to be free days for picking up stuff that we've missed or for getting stuff that we've just thought about during the, during the mm -hmm. production, and then rely on the AD to be in dialogue with the DP and the director every day to make sure we're not shooting what we don't need. We're shooting enough coverage to give the editor choice, yeah. but not what we don't need. So and then don't miss through. anything. Mm. Yeah, don't miss stuff. <laughs> you know, well, there's no advice. reason, but a lot of times there's no reason why you should. Mm. You know, you should be building it, so there's no reason to cock up. And this isn't answering your question, is it? But I think, um, I think it's important um, to, to, learn to, to learn about scheduling and, and budgeting as a producer so you can keep an eye on what your line producer is doing because not everybody's like us. You know, a lot where well, we have to do cost reports and, and in the old days we used to do print reports, so, or stock reports. Mm -hmm. So in the old days you used to say how much film you had left because mm -hmm. you'd quite often run out of film, which is a major problem mm -hmm. at £1,000 every 10 minutes. So I come from that, you know, we come from that discipline where mm -hmm. you are still looking at how many feet you shot per day, or how many minutes down you shot per day. Yeah. And, um, I, I don't know, on a film I worked on, there was no proper rushes viewing, there was mm. no proper assembly viewing, and yeah, there, there, was, there was almost half as many pick-up days as the actual shoot. Mm. That, is a, that is a real and problem, because we don't get to see what we've shot. There's no reason not to these days, properly. because you're not waiting two days for it to come back from the lab. No, but you are waiting so, for it to ingest, and one of the things that I'm trying to do as a gold standard is try to find a way to get assembly and DIT together, so I can start to see mm. an assembled scene quickly from digital, because we see, we see it from the camera, but we don't see if in context in terms of where the holes are. And that's how we saved gridiron, because we saw what we were shooting every day. And I made sure, I sat with the, D, the DIT who was assembling every day to make sure that we had no holes. Yeah. So we had no holes in the, and we finished that film in 16 days, but it wasn't ideal. But the 16 days wasn't real, because we, there were three days of pickups that needed to be done, but they didn't need key cast. They were just American football yeah. gameplay, which they could do on any given Sunday at... Um, at the crew um, railroaders stadium to pick up the bits that they needed to fit into the film. Mm. Um, we had a schedule, what, two, three weeks, Sean? We ended up filming for three years. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to Still get that budget, together, though. Because yeah. I budget. said, once you've, got everyone, once you've got everyone together, Just and then everyone going. buggers off and goes on other jobs. You can't get the back. It's impossible to get those actors back. I had to grow a beard. Well, we didn't have a beard in the film. We had an actor who went into puberty, so his voice oh changed. <laughs> and so even on ADR, his voice was too deep. Mm. And it's not, I'm not joking, it's a yeah. real problem. You know, people, or people cut their hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah we had a haircut and a change, beard. People change. <laughs> Or get, or get yes. You don't do it in telly, so I don't know why we do it in film. Really. Yeah, so crazy. These kind of um, like these directors in America say we shot them over like twenty weekends or something, mm. grand, and you shouldn't spend a penny more. So you won't get it back. That's true. Like Benny and Jolene, they made that in ten days, didn't they? Yeah, no, you know? no, no, I'm, I'm planning to make a film in ten days myself. <laughs> but what I'm doing, what what I've decided to do as a director is take. So I haven't worked in quite a lot in TV recently. When they're writing the scripts, and Darren's bored of this. Anyway, <laughs> uh, my Witherspoon's theory. It's Witherspoon's great. Musical. Musical. <laughs> so it's great theory that we we writers and TV are forced to use parameters. So you're only allowed mm. to use one car, say per day, like two extras or three nurses. And, and so the things are written with parameters in mind. What we don't do as filmmakers is write with parameters in mind. So if you mm. if you can actually write a film with parameters in mind, that doesn't just use a, one room. Um, 
uh, then you, it is possible to make something cheap, cheaper and, and quicker. And, mm -hmm. and so um, it's about picking the right script, really, um, yeah. out, out of the right parameters. Yeah. I was told there's the triangle of cheap, quick... Fast and good. Good, and you can have two of them. <laughs> Any two. Mm. And like but crazy, yeah, two interesting of films. Anyone seen that like, like crazy? Mm. What about the, the girl who has to go back to him? The guy's died now, hasn't he, unfortunately? Yeah. 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 She's, she's ridiculously mm. famous now, isn't she? She wrote one. She wrote one, yeah. That was made on a DSLR mm. in people's bedrooms and on the streets. And I mean, you can, you can make a really lovely romantic, mm. romantic comedy or a romance yeah. just with bedrooms and hallways. Yeah. And, yeah. But, yeah. it, but it comes back to the original script. It comes back to the purpose of it story. and the story. My Weatherspoon's musical thing, the, the, the reason I'm, <laughs> I'm semi-obsessed about Weatherspoon is because they open, they open at 8 a.m., it's free coffee, they're that. free charging, they're free Wi-Fi, they're heated, they don't give a shit about you doing costume and makeup in mm. it. They are a godsend to yeah. live producers. <laughs> yeah. Because you could just yeah. put 25, 30 crew in there, you know exactly how much breakfast is, mm. exactly how much lunch is. <laughs> they are brilliant. And then mm. every town has one. So that's your unit base. Yeah. It's cheap. It's cheap <laughs> as well. And actually, Except I'm the, um, as vegetarian, the, the food's all right. Yeah. Yeah. Except the beers, right. which we did a few years ago. So we yeah. for love tomorrow, but we needed to put a tab on the, um, we need to put 50 quid to use it, yeah. just right. to use the back, back corner. Yeah. In Greenwich, we've used the um, <coughs> Greenwich upstairs in the main which is the weather spoons there, that's the um, clock tower or whatever it's okay. called. But we've used it upstairs, we've hired it for the I'd day. I'd be too embarrassed mm. to say if I knew it straight away. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was, uh, pubs are struggling, so they really are great unit bases yeah. pubs. Mm. And, they're, and they're open till late, and, yeah. they, and they're cleaners coming and out. And essentially your unit base shouldn't be very many people, because you only have the people you need. So it, mostly everybody else should be out on set, so you really only have makeup, costume, second AD, mm. Church halls. Line producer. Yep. I was going to wrap up with what was your favourite money saving production advice, but I think you both said Witherspoons, haven't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's water bottles. Water actually. bottles, exactly. I'm going to put water bottles as well. I budgeted, uh, I worked out on a cost report that I had spent £900 just on water um, a week. Two grand on one sheet. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A week. Well, think, yeah. And this was people just throwing away the water bottles. So it's what I do these days is if I can't afford to buy plastic water bottles and label them with people's names on them. I have a wonderful, I have, um, I have a rule with runners. I don't really have runners on set. I have assistants on set because you call them runners and they just run and disappear. Um, <laughs> but I call them assistants and I give them jobs and I say, shit job, one day you get the shit job, tomorrow you get to choose what you want to do. So shit job is labelling everybody's really bottle and handing it out, filling it up with from a bigger bottle and oh. handing it out with a lab name on it so that we know who's left their water bottle half full because we can't throw water away. It's just criminal. Mm. I come from Australia where there's no water and we've been in drought for years and years and years and we eat horrible vegetables as a result. Can't do it. It's and you've, got to pay, you've got to pay for the rubbish to be taken yeah. away at the end of the day. They get in the way on set. But if you, if you go to Water Aid, they, they have plastic bottles mm. in Water Aid. You're helping a charity out. And any crew member that starts having a go at you, just say, look, are you trying to take water off people in the developing <laughs> country? <laughs> and so, good, you know, it, it, but it is... It water is, is the biggest because we're, every location has a tap. Mm. I think it's two thousand one hundred pounds on one film we spent on water. Yeah. The other, the other money saving tips, quickly go them is, is, is congestion charge. So mm. rarely is thought about, and then not sorting out the contracts with crew and cast about parking and driving. Yeah. I've had a DP proper, say proper to me that he, he expected car parking every day. Off. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can't, and, and, but it was yeah. in his contract. It says you will not, you know. Yeah. So making, I mean, I do know one shoot that, that, that went mm. that went nearly. Up to, I think it's like nine thousand over budget on on congestion charge. So I think the things where you go wrong, congestion charging water, mm. catering is actually very easy to keep a cap Catering on. should be right, Cat Catering is, is is surprisingly. People think that they've got to buy by all actors, of their... Actors getting set, that's another that's, pitch. That's so, <laughs> so, so often the producer's so excited they've got the actor, they haven't actually signed the contract properly. Mm -hmm. And then the actor expects to be driven to set every day. Exclusively. Now you're looking, mm -hmm. you're looking at over the course of a, of a, a lot of film, you know, thousands and thousands of pounds. Because as soon as one actor gets driven in, the other one's like, hang on, that guy's... <laughs> and, it's, they, and I understand why they're doing it. They say they want to prepare, they want to read their scripts on the way. They don't want to be bothered to find the location. But, on a, on a, but it's something that has to be sorted out front. So you have, front you have to have budgeted you know, for it. That's really important when you're doing a pr provisional budget, and I always do, is to make sure I have allowance for travel for cast. Using, using standard minicabs, um, unless they're people like Jerry Hall where I have to use Addison Lee because they contain have the high enough um, insurance uh, for, oh, right, for so public right. liability yeah, and indemnity. Uh, Uber's not... Um, I don't know. So I'll say it, but it's, someone will tell me it's changed, but you're not insured 
necessarily in a new guide. Right. Probably but if you use a licensed mini camper, you're okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so we, I allow that, and I always put in the contract, um, even for leads, that on this level budget, it's non-exclusive travel. So you will be travelling with someone else, and it may be a crew member, or it may be. Uh, I've just found it easier. As long as I've budgeted for it, then I've got the money in the budget for mm. it. If I haven't budgeted for it, then I'm in trouble. But it means that I know that the actors are not going to get lost on the tube. I had an actor who was coming from Walthamstow to Royal Park, but I don't know how, but somehow she caught a train to um, South End on Sea. Mm. <laughs> like, because they're, because they're, they're, not, they're not in the zone. <laughs> they're, not, they're not in that zone. So it's actually kind of useful to budget for it and arrange for yeah. the actors to arrive at cast, yeah. the cast to arrive on set yeah. on time. We cast our lead and found out he lived in Spain, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With horses. Yeah. But it was quite cheap to get a 50 quid flight from <laughs> Madrid. Probably cheaper think. than getting him out in London. Yeah, like Fi that, yeah. Firing people on set is really hard as well. That yeah. can cost you a lot of money, obviously. Or probably. paying them off. Well, no, not well. What are you saying? Uh, no, uh, just for just him to fire someone. Because right. then you're going to have to replace someone very, oh, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. That's quite a tricky thing to do. And you do have to do it. Indeed. Any last questions? Uh, do you source uh, most of your funds privately? That was a different session. Yeah, day, you missed but that. Line. Yeah, but yeah, um, that's more producers getting the dosh in. These guys spend the money, not find it. Yeah, yeah. But, 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 but the it is online. There's a recording of it online. Which yeah, if you look at the previous producer finance. panel, yeah, it's a lot about yeah. SCI schemes, tax breaks. The things I've only produced people. recently have all been private equity. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you have a chat over, over a beer, yeah. this man. Yep. Line producer services when you've picked, you've got a script and you're pitching to clients mm. and you've got a budget in mind and they say has that been backed up by a line producer? Mm. I'll go to a similar film. So you get a, get a matching film that you've seen, matching budget, a comparable film, and then find out how the, who the line producer is. And as you, know, as you saw, well, I, well, we all need to make a living, and then approach that person. And to be honest, if, if Claire can do it or I can do it, we'd know another like producer who yeah. could or a production manager coming up through the ranks. You might find a, a production manager or a production coordinator, coordinator do your budget schedule for free anyway to step up. Hmm. So, so most... Um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so... You can go back to the finances and say... Yeah, well, yeah. And to be honest, finances, when they see it, when they see a properly laid out budget and schedule, they're not going to know what the hell is going on because they're quite a specific format. They might do, but they're, they're yeah. a specific it, format which they not, won't be familiar with. It's not like an Excel spreadsheet. So, so, uh, so quite yeah. often they'll be, they would, they would be convinced by what's in front of them. It's a question of when it's useful sense. to do it, because it's not useful to do it just because you've got the script. And now you want to approach financiers. It's it's useful to spend that money once you know you've got a reasonable chance of having the script move forward, and that you they're asking for it because. From a producing point of view, I can do my own. I do my own budgets and my own schedules because I can. I get someone else to look at them just to make sure I haven't been blinded to something that um, by just overlooking it all the time. So I get someone to double check it for me, but I do the main work myself. But there are a lot of people out there who are playing the game of financing, and they're not real, and so they put you to all this expense to um, to, to engage someone like me to do a proper budget. Now, when you engage me, I'm expecting this is going to get funded and be real. It might take three or four years for it to come to fruition, but I'm expecting that it's going to be a real proposition and that you've got the money therefore to pay me. Because I'm not in the interest, in the, when I'm in my line producer capacity, I'm not in the, um, in the mode of trying to rip off producers just to pay my rent. I want to build a relationship with that producer if I want to move forward. So if you came to me and said, well, I've got the script and I need to get it backed up, I'd say the same thing. Go and look at a similar budget. Um, see how far you get with that before you pay one of us to do the spec budget for you. Once you've got the spec budget, then you are backed up. But make sure that the person you're talking to is real before you bring the line producer in to do, because you're going to have to spend, uh, spend probably 10% of, or 1% of the budget to pay mm -hmm. of your expected budget to negotiate with a line producer like us to, to do it. Just thought another thing that you go over budget on a lot is national insurance contributions and pensions and holiday pay. Budget them in, budget them in, make sure they're in. something that's a bit of a pain in the ass. I have just heard that pensions now have to be, are going to possibly be put, put into budgets, yeah, is that right? Yeah, there's pension a production build thing coming out about that now. I've got to read it, yeah. so... Yeah. And that's a real... But that's the other thing to do, go to a production guild um, evening. It's full of line producers <laughs> yeah. and producers. They happen yeah. here as well. Yeah. They have nights here, so you mm. can pop in. Talk to Eric here, yeah, totally it's on his calendar, hopefully. Any last? Yeah. yeah. I've got, I've got Sorry. Uh, Budgets that fail grand or ten grand. Is that 
Second. A, a budget, for example, that's 5K, 10K. Yeah. That's what, for a feature film budget? For a short film, for example. For a short film. Yeah. I think, uh, I certainly when I used to make shorts, we'd still put them in movie magic. We'd put, still put them in movie scheduling. We'd still make a schedule yeah. over budget. I think in the early days, I think I was doing it on Excel, maybe. There's uh, um, template budgets from Film London. Yeah. Yeah. And also... Just do, it, just do it yourself. Well, the other thing, too, is that... Um, but, it's, but, you know, what? Getting a crew together to make a short film is the same amount of effort to get a crew together to make a feature film. Mm. It's exactly the same team. Size. Same people. So it's the, exactly the same amount we of effort. We made a 15-minute short a few years ago with Bruce. Yeah. On two of the days, we had 47 people. Hmm. Yeah. 47 people. Yes, your average crew, I think, normally think is about 35 people. Two massive yeah. flights, a big generator. Mm. Yeah. All the money that was spent getting everybody there... If you want to know about, you some money from as well. if you do want to know about budgeting and you do want to get a start on it, the Production Guild has actually got a website called Production Accounting Forum, which has got lots of templates and lots of um, best practice examples of how to do budgets, how to do cost mm. reports, um, what the legislative requirements are. So What's that's the name of the Production Accounting Forum. So if you do a search for it, Production Guild, Production Accounting Forum, you should be able to find it. It used to be the New Producers Alliance, which, which is sadly, yeah, sadly oh, gone, yeah. yeah. But there was a place, this is the, this, this is why I was quite excited about this group, it's the closest we've got to an mm. informal yeah, similar. drinking thing. <laughs> <laughs> Beer and information. Lots yeah. more questions. Yeah. Um, yeah, you both talked about certain um, locations in London are becoming more, more difficult than filming in other cities across the UK. Well, just creatively to find. Yeah. yeah, but it might be also like, is it also becoming more expensive, Nate? I don't think well? it is, actually. So it's just difficult. Um, shooting more used shoot, to it shooting exteriors is okay. Yeah. Shooting exteriors is no problem at all, as long as you've got a small crew mm. and you can you don't have to shut roads and you don't have to block traffic and you don't have to block people. That's fine. So guerrilla style filming, as long as it's licensed, yeah. is mm. is the way that we do our exteriors. So it's where we go to our close exterior. So go, people going into doors and out of doors. That's close exterior. Mm. We can't see what's behind them, so we shoot that on another day, same weather. Um, or interiors, we sometimes have to go out of central London and further out just to shoot those because they're easier to find and cheaper to do. But then you have to model out the cost of moving people out beyond the tube network because the tube is, is good, travelling around London is good. And you mm. see camera crews travelling on the tube these days. Mm. I'd, say, I'd, say, I'd say it's very easy to film in houses now because everyone's broke. Everyone's yeah. got to pay their mortgage. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so I find house hiring very easy. But only once. Once they've had a film crew in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not doing it again. Yeah, you've got your friends very so, so, so my question actually leads, leads on to that, like we're shipping people to different locations. So let's say you actually decide not to do it in the vicinity of, of London, but for example, Bristol or something. How does the supply of crew actually uh, uh, look like in those cities? Because on the one hand, you could get London crew. Obviously, you have more mm. supply, but you need to pay their travel and accommodation, or you can get local. Well, you don't. It's kind of easy. Well, I've, I've just shot a short. Crew? Well, I've just shot a shot, a short in um, Froome which is close to Bath, Bristol, and it was surprisingly easy to get crew because there are a lot of people who have moved west. Um, they've moved out yeah. past Pinewood. There's and a so, lot of Italian Bristol as well. Yeah, like, and there's so, yeah. Cardiff as well, so across the... Yeah. Across the one, one thing I'd say yeah. is that we're in the, you don't, if you work in a, in, a, in a job, you don't get paid to go to work, do you? You don't get, paid, you don't get your travel paid in a, in a normal job. So, and it's a really harsh and awful thing you have to say to crew is, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pay for you to come onto this job. I'm going to pay for you to get... If we're moving away from a unit mm. where we're working, then obviously we'll pay for you to get there. Mm. But we can't pay for you to get to work every day. So, You've got to make um, And I've worked in Dublin recently for the last couple of years directing. I didn't get paid in travel or accommodation. Is uh, accommodation? No. Uh, okay. no. Because there's a... Because... because mm -hmm. oh, why? Why should I? Uh, I don't you know. know. Because I'm you're not, not working I'm, at your... I'm, I'm, I'm directing like a... business trip. <laughs> but, these, but these are the... These but that's my choice, isn't it? So, but these are the so, variables that we're talking about. These are the variable costs we're talking about. You can model out, all right, I'm going to go to Bristol. I'm going to have to rely on the crew that are available that are not doing tally at the moment or not doing um, other films at the moment. Um, if I can't get them, then I'm going to have to bring people in from further afield, and it may be mm. the deal that I have to pay for their accommodation. So this is where the line producing, where I can save money and rationalise costs, comes in. Mm. So I make a decision. Do I take whoever I can get locally, and then I'll supplement with people from out of town, and I will make sure that they are accommodated, 
because we're travelling more than it. I think the rule of thumb is 30 minutes, 30 minutes travelling time. Yeah, the law is changing. It's, as um, well, it's it? a rule of thumb. It's not a um, Don't it's not film a in the summer, though, because you'll never find any accommodation. Mm. <laughs> I mean, the best time to film anything is January, February, because no one has any work. So you get cheaper crew, cheaper accommodation, mm. cheaper equipment. Yeah. No one's got anything on. But and make it's, sure it's where a lot of low-budget stuff gets made, isn't it? Make uh, sure it's in the contracts. Make sure that the expenses policy, because, again, you can be burned by people... If the, if the expenses policy in the contract isn't clear to say you won't be paid for your travel, my, mm. my phrase is you won't ordinarily be paid for your travel from your place uh, of your residence mm. to the unit base or location, but thereafter we will pay the travel within that. Um, yeah, I see unless, that zone six or seven. Unless I've approved it in advance. If I've approved it in advance, that's okay. If you can't show me the letter of approval that says that I have approved you to travel and I'm going to pay for you. So I'll pay for people like Costume who are picking things up on the way, they're doing production stuff. I'll pay for people who need to be there um, early um, to accommodate them rather than have them arriving at set already tired. So there are things that I will judge against the cost, against the value of their work contribution in the day, but ordinarily the price, the cost of you getting from your house to the place of work, HMRC doesn't give us any slack as line producers. We have to be aware of what HMRC says, and they say it is the employee's responsibility to get themselves to work. When people are freelancing, that's a business cost that they can expense themselves. So mm -hmm. why should they double dip with us? We see a lot of thumb. You see a lot of thumbprint clocking in going on on TV dramas now. So the crew thumbprint in and thumbprint out which really screws up um, people like props people and costume people because mm. they might go and pick something up on yeah, the way to the work, way, way they to might work. work very late. Mm. Well, good. Time for drinking. <laughs> okay, if we can thank Claire and Bruce. <laughs> <laughs>